Okay. Welcome and thanks everyone for joining us today um, as we have an open conversation about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Um, we hope that you're enjoying our Credential Month events. I'm Tasha Washington, Senior Associate of Student Engagement here at the Capital Collab, a Greater Washington Partnership. I work with students in the Digital Tech Credential Program, working with Capital Region Universities, um, as we help students gain in-demand skills that they need for the jobs of tomorrow. Um, I want to briefly introduce our speakers for today's session, and we can jump right into our questions. Um, if you've attended our Credential Month events in the past, you may recognize this familiar face. This is Adrian Alberts. Adrian Alberts is the Chief Diversity Officer at American Red Cross and has been an active organizational leader focused on diversity, talent management, operations, and career development for more than 20 years. In her current role, she leads enterprise-wide diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts. Adrienne's experience with the Red Cross spanned seven years, where she worked in strategic roles in human resources and disaster cycle services. Adrienne is a native of Virginia and received her master's in counseling um, psychology with a concentration of college and student personnel administration and her bachelor's in psychology from James Madison University. Welcome, Adrienne. Hello. Our next speaker is Sally Bartas. She is the VP Corporate HR and Staff Executive at Stanley Black & Decker. Sally has, over, Sally has over eight years uh, with Daily Black & Decker as an HR business partner, talent management, and diversity and inclusion. Before Sally began her career at Stanley Black & Decker, she was in sales and marketing for seven years and spent four years working in human resources within the hospitality industry. She went to Central Connecticut State University and earned her degree in communications with a concentration in public relations and promotions. In her role, Sally has focused on training and development, and she really cares about bringing people to a new level in their careers and being a change catalyst within her organization. When she's not working, she can be found camping um, with her family and friends and enjoying everything outdoors. Welcome, Sally. Thank you, Tasha. All right, I want to go right into it. Um, Sally and Adrian, as we've heard, you both have some very impressive backgrounds. Um, I'd love to hear more about your personal stories and how you've gotten to the diversity and inclusion work and you know what you're doing and what diversity and inclusion means to you both. Adrian, do you want to go first or I can? Sure, sure. I'll go in. Um, so um, hello, delighted to be here. Um, so I'll start by saying my pronouns are she and her. Um, and how did I get into this? So I think it all started actually at James Madison University where I went, uh, went to school undergrad and I was involved in, so James Madison University is a predominantly white institution and I was involved in a student organization called Students for Minority Outreach. And the whole purpose of the organization was to help recruit and engage and retain um, diverse candidates to the campus. And so I really got involved in what that meant and, and learned a little bit more about um, what having a more diverse environment and more inclusive perspectives can really do for that educational institution. Um, and those premises really follow through even today. Um, so I would offer that since then, I've done a lot of stuff in, in my career, but every single role I've had, whether it was formally a part of the role, or something that I took on because I just personally have a passion or interest, it's always had something to do with diversity and equity and inclusion. And so um, I really feel like my path kind of prepared me for the role that I'm in today. Um, and then let me just add to Tasha's question, this notion of what does diversity and inclusion mean to me? Um, at, at the core, it really means to me that nobody has to check any part of who they are when they walk in the door, wherever that is, right? whether it's your institution, whether it's a place that you might be going to do an internship, your job after graduation, you shouldn't have to figure out what parts of you are acceptable in that environment. Every part of you is acceptable in that environment. And that's for everybody who's on the call. And so it's not for me as simple as this notion of race and ethnicity and gender orientation, I mean, gender identity and sexual orientation and ability. And it's not si simply defined as that. There's so many intersectionalities that it really is about being who you are in all those spaces and us being able to celebrate and leverage that to make those spaces the best that they can be. So that's my thought on that. That's, that's a hard one to follow. I, I think <laughs> Adrian, just hearing your background is very impressive and in, in your, your journey there. Um, you know, for me, it, it became more of a, um, 
I, I will say that not that I didn't fall upon it, but um, I took a little bit more of a jungle gym uh, approach to my career. Um, you know, I started in HR, I went to school for marketing, um, and I had moved around I'm originally from Connecticut. And so I moved to New York after school um, and I landed in sales. And part of it, um, you know, is a little scary, right? Um, you have to really influence people and get them excited. And this particular type of sales was uh, sports and entertainment. So I said, I can talk about this, right? I can get people excited about it. Um, but at the time, I was in an interesting part of my life where I had just been in a car accident um, and I had at the age of 24, 25, had to get braces and, you know, was dealing with a lot of um, recovery. Um, and, you know, with that said, going out and talking to people and that, you know, are really folks that you don't know, right? And now you have to really sell your, uh, your product and the way you approach them. And for me, it was really a lot around not being afraid um, and being confident in in my approach. Um, and I learned a lot in that in that role. I was able to really grow into a management uh, career within a year. And, and you know throughout the seven to eight years I was with that company, I opened several offices and ran my own and and got involved in a lot of uh, you know showing people early in their career what they are capable of doing. Um, if they have the right attitude and the right approach. And for me, that engagement and that training and that growth um, was what got me back into HR again um, in, a, in a different way. So when I joined Stanley Black & Decker, um, my first role was really in a generalist capacity. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, working with individuals and working with groups on communication and uh, really ultimately having these workshops that involve effectiveness and accepting different styles and different approaches in the way we behave and communicate and how we come to the table. And at the time, Stanley Black & Decker didn't have diversity uh, and inclusion or even were talking necessarily about uh, you know, that kind of uh, department, at least at a corporate level. So I, had, I was working within the global tools and storage business and had the opportunity to go into a development or talent development role that was also specifically focused on driving diversity uh, and inclusion across our organization. Um, and for me, it was really, well, I grew up in um, a multicultural and several different identities, uh, you know, layers of identity. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. You know, for me, it was learning more about what it looks like in the workplace. And um, to Adrian's point, how do we create an engaging environment where people do feel um, accepted and also educating, right? Educating our leaders on truly what, um, you know, what the right behaviors are in order to make people feel included. Um, the focus for me, what I learned is that inclusion has to come first, right? That creating that environment of inclusion is what is going to retain our diverse associates. Um, and so I, I evolved into that role. For me, it was so exciting to see at the time affinity networks that we put up. Um, now we have nine different employee resource groups with hundreds of chapters across the world. Um, and for me, it was just so empowering uh, to see the types of networks we were able to create and the, and the communities that we were able to develop um, that in, that honestly people tell me today, I, I don't know if I would have stayed if I didn't join our women's network or if I didn't have our African ancestry network to be a part of. Um, and for me, that was just so powerful. And even today, while I'm not in a, in a specific DE&I role, um, I continuously have that lens when we make talent decisions, when we're in conversations related to our workforce. Um, and so it's always really um, been an ongoing lifelong learning for me as it relates to that specific area. Um, so, um, and, and, and I would say, you know, just to add, you know, what does it mean now, right? I think for, for me, it's it's really evolved. Um, aside from to, to Adrian's point, uh, the the color of your skin or your gender, you know, as we think about this globally, um, this has become truly a 
I, I don't like to say initiative because uh, you know it really isn't, but this needs to become the fabric of the way we do business. Um, and when I, you know, when I hear stories, our company's done a lot of listening sessions based on all of the things that have been occurring um, over the last year. Um, and you know, it still shocks me to this day that we have employees that are going through um, such adversity. Um, and and so for me, it's really about creating that environment and also outside of work, right? How do we how do we give our folks grace? How do we give uh, how do we understand what they're going through so that we can help them, uh, you know, thrive in their workplace? Thank you so much um, to you both, Adriana and Sally. Um, this really ties into my next question um, that we have for the students and also, st uh, also attendees, feel free to chat your questions below. Um, we will address those all at the end. Um, but as we talk about fitting in you know, into the workplace now, what should students be looking for as they begin to evaluate you know, companies for employment and start to research companies for employment? What are some things they should be looking for right now? So, Oh, sorry, Sally. Do were you going to no, jump? Go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Um, so, so there are th so visually, right? Do your homework. So this is one of those we did call this like a, a a candid chat, right? So I can tell people, right, what I wouldn't tell. Of course, them. absolutely. Inside scoop now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so visually look for diversity right so just see and you won't always find it so i'm going to speak to that too but look for it right look at a website look at the information that that the organization shares to represent who they are to see if you see perspectives that you feel represent something that feels like it would align with who you are whether it's the values whether it's the representation of the executive leadership team um, whether it is the visuals they have about employees or their products, right? But really be thoughtful about whether or not you see things that align with your values, um, how you would define yourself in that information. Now, you might find yourself in a place where you don't see, for example, an executive leadership team that reflects you, um, if you can even see it, right? You might not be able to see it visually. Um, but if you don't, and if you can't it tell innately, there are things that you can, um, checking to see if an organization has a diversity and inclusion page that talks about who they are. And if they have, as Sally so mentioned, the really importance of resource groups in an organization. And I always link them to like clubs, right? Uh, student organizations and clubs on your campus, they're very similar, right? It's people coming together around a topic and is an issue that's really passionate to them. So it could be a part of their identity. It could be their passion around philanthropy, whatever those things are, and doing work that both furthers the organization's mission, but also hopefully the communities that the organization serves in as well. But it gives you an opportunity to see if there is an innate community that exists in that organization um, and a way to further connect. And then the last thing that I'll offer is, I would also encourage you to ask people. So you've got LinkedIn, you've got your alumni, talk to them about what the culture of the organization feels like and looks like to them. And if there are ways for you to connect with a community that you feel might be reflective of who you are in your identities um, as you're thinking about joining an organization. Those are a few things that I might do um, if I were researching today versus what I did when I was in your feet back then. I didn't do it well then, um, but I wish I had thought of these things back then. Yeah, 100%, Adrian. I think, you know, I would echo, obviously, the representation is huge. Um, you know, there, there's nothing worse than, than interviewing on a panel and you can't relate with anybody that you're speaking to. Um, you know, and if you can't find that, you know, every company is on a different journey. And, and while they do have uh, you know, it's going to take time, especially at a leadership level, if that wasn't the case before. So, you know, pay attention to the programs they have. What I think is super important, too, is to pay attention to the company's purpose. Um, are they truly, you know, doing things that align to what they say is important to them? Um, but, you know, do the research as it relates to the purpose, but also does it connect with you? Does it resonate with you? Is it something that you would come to work passionate about? 
And also, can you get involved, even if it's not in your function, right? If it's not particularly in your, in your uh, you know, if you're looking for something in engineering or HR or what have you, you know, does this company have a culture where you can still raise your hand and get involved in things that you're really passionate about? Um, because sometimes what's more important is that passion than the perks the company offers, right? Um, and, and, and truly, as we go into this kind of future of work, um, is it conducive to your, your life right now? Um, everyone has a different story and a different, uh, you know, environment that they're dealing with right now, especially as it relates to, you know, post, not even post, but pandemic, right? Um, is the company have flexibility that you need? Um, you know, those are, those are some really important things that I think um, I didn't learn until later. Um, and, and I think truly uh, I've been able to go on that journey with my organization to establish what that culture and that purpose looks like. Can I add to that? Let me just also add, so I love what Sally said. We're going to keep doing this. It's going to be the mutual admiration society, but... <laughs> <laughs> but the notion of, right, like if the organization could be on a journey, I would encourage each of you to add into the questions you're going to ask in an interview, particularly if this is really important to you, right, to ask the question, what are you doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? You'll probably get a lot of different perspectives depending on how many people that you're talking to in an interview, but those collective uh, perspectives will start to paint a story for you. Um, and if you feel like they're not as far along as maybe you would hope, as you hear those answers, you can also ask the follow-up question of, are there opportunities for individuals to get involved if they're really passionate about it? Um, and again, you're interviewing organizations too. So asking those types of questions, I think will also start to give you a sense of it um, as you're, and give you enough information to start making decisions when you're deciding with whom you wanna do your internships or uh, where you wanna start your first job. Thank you both. Really, really great points um, there. And I think it all, all comes down again to the students doing the research, right, on the organizations that they're trying to join. Um, so my next question is, um, so the students, you know, they, they research their organizations, they've gotten the job or gotten the interview. And now as a new employee that comes from this diverse background, they may feel a bit disadvantaged um, being a new employee. And then imposter syndrome starts to creep in. So what advice could you offer for our students or what tactics could you offer for our students um, to use to combat those feelings in that new workplace? Yeah, I mean, I think about, you know, I, I just think about my, my background or my, my experience. Um, and I have been, you know, what I will say is I've been very fortunate in my career, in my work environment, uh, where I've had leaders that have created that um, environment for me to thrive and be feel like my full self, but I can't say that was always the case. Um, I know, you know, for me, I come from two different cultural backgrounds, and um, my mother's from Dominican Republic, and my father is Palestinian. Um, and you know, I grew up in uh, East Hartford, Connecticut, which was much more diverse. But I, I really, the from junior high on, um, I was in Simsbury, Connecticut. So anyone that knows. Uh, that area, it's it's it was predominantly white when I was going to high school and junior high, and you know I get the question, what are you, right? Um, and part of me didn't really bring my full self because I didn't want to explain the the different layers of identity that I had, right? And and early on, you want to assimilate. It's that it's that notion of assimilation or imposter syndrome. Um, and at the time, being young, I didn't really think about my you know my layers of identity. I just assimilated because I wanted to belong, right? And as you grow, uh, even in college, um, you have this, uh, for me, it was, oh, I'm not Hispanic enough because I didn't speak fluent Spanish or I wasn't you know, Palestinian enough because I didn't speak Arabic and where do I belong? Um, and, and so you have to really think about you know, surrounding yourself with people that will create that space for you. And like I said, you know, going into, uh, you know, a new organization, it can be hard to assimilate sometimes, especially if you're virtual, right, for the first, uh, you know, depending on the environment or the, the company. And so, you know, I would, I would say try to create a network um, that you find people that are going against the grain, um, maybe they, uh, you know, they don't necessarily look like you, but 
um, you resonate with their, their behavior style or you resonate with the way they approach a certain problem um, and, and network with them and allow them to help you create that space. Um, and, you know, also, again, join an ERG if they have one. Join, you know, create a network um, where you can truly lean on people to talk about how your day is going. Not everyone's going to have 100% of a day and be happy every single day. It's okay to not be okay sometimes. Um, and so, you know, there are times where we don't always feel like we can be our full selves at first until we create that space or have that network of people, um, but also check in with how you're feeling in certain situations, right? Um, and I would, I would encourage you to be courageous with those conversations with the people that you do trust um, as you start to onboard and start to assimilate yourself into that kind of culture or organization. Um, the other thing I would say is, is think of it, you know, not as necessarily, we tell our leaders, you're not looking for a fit into your team, you're looking for an ad, right? You're looking for someone that can add to the dynamic of your team and the, diver the diversity of thought and the diversity of just, you know, who we are as a culture. Um, and think of your way, think of yourself in that way, right? You are an add to the organization. They brought you on because they saw something that they really, really liked. Um, and so making sure that, you know, you ask questions and you surround yourself um, is, is super important. Um, so, so those are those are kind of the things that I would say as you're first starting. I, it really just depends too on on the organization and the environment, right? So I would add. So I am a first generation college student, um, or I was. <laughs> I'm not today. Um, I was, um, and that that added some complexity for me, right? I I wasn't always confident that I knew how to navigate the environment. And my father was career military and my mom was started in the military and then was career civil servant. So they didn't work in the types of organizations that I've worked in across my career. And so then navigating that, I felt a little intimidated by what, how do you navigate environments like these? Um, and so I, I definitely was I spent a lot of time intimidated when I, when I first started, I remember being at my first orientation for my first job and they were talking about uh, retirement plans and um, medical plans. And I'm like, I was 23 trying to, I'm like, what are you talking about? So I was entirely intimidated by a lot of those things. So um, one, I would offer like this notion of imposter syndrome or if people are really starting in these interesting environments, everybody around you feels that way too. So just know it people may look exceedingly confident. People tell me all the time, you have such a presence, you always look so confident. And I am petrified often <laughs> in the rooms that I'm stepping in and the work that I'm doing. So just know, just if you can just believe me on this one, everybody sitting around you is petrified with you, <laughs> right? Let it give you a sense of peace and calm that you are not alone in that. So start there with just the, okay, they may not show it, but these people on either side of me are as freaked out about this as I am, right? So start there. The second thing that I would offer, and I really appreciate that, that because it's a, an add-on to what Sally said was, finding the right community is crucial, right? There, many organizations will have a resource group for early career individuals. So you can find that group of individuals who were recently interns or who have been with the organization for maybe less than two or three years to really start to say, okay, this feels like a place at least to start. Um, and so finding that community is important. And then the only other thing I'll add is this notion of relying on your network outside of work, I think is important also, right? Because everything in your life isn't gonna be what you're doing at your job. And one of the things that has really, really helped me across my career from the earliest points to today is I've relied on a network of some really trusted friends who were probably going through similar things that I was, even if we weren't in the same place, to be able to have those conversations in full transparency and trust because I didn't have to worry about making those first impressions there. Um, and that was really helpful because we helped each other figure out, okay, how might we approach this? And are you gonna go find the resource group today? Okay, I am too, right? So it, it felt like I wasn't doing it alone as I was identifying those 
um, communities within the organization. Um, and then I felt fully supported because I had both, right, internally and externally, and I felt really supported. A hundred percent, Adrian. I can't tell you enough. I when I moved to Maryland five years ago, you know, I really didn't know a lot of people down here. We moved without, you know, family around in the area, and for me, it was about finding an outside network that I could really connect with and relate with. And I happened to fall upon Alpha, which is a national organization. Uh, for Latino professionals. And now I sit on the board and it's just, it's been an amazing experience. Um, and also helping other people with that same, you know, kind of uh, orientation or not knowing what to do in, in terms of their career path. Um, and so that was extremely helpful. Um, it's just the outside network has been huge. And, and what I will say is if you can, if you can figure out how to find, you know, there's the difference between a coach a mentor and a sponsor, right? There's a coach that talks to you um, that, you know, I'm sorry, a coach really talks with you, right? They're, they're alongside with you. They're helping you with a particular challenge. A mentor talks at you. There's someone who can give their own experience and, and, and history of knowledge that then you can take and apply. And then you have a sponsor that talks about you when you're not in the room. And what I will say is I've had all three throughout my career and I continue to have those through informal and formal programs. If you can find someone that can coach you through an issue or that can help you through a specific way of doing something by, by mentoring or even, even better, a sponsor who can help you and, and create a, a network for you, I mean, that is the way to go, right? That is truly uh, so important and it's been so valuable in, in my career as well. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, this is, you know, this is, this webinar is going really great. And I will say, um, you know, as, as Adrian mentioned, um, candid, right? Our conversations about diversity. Um, one of the things I want to go back to is your authentic self. And you both have mentioned, you know, the confidence and being authentic, but what does that really mean for a student, right? And how can they show up as their most authentic self in their workplace? So we're both pausing because we're both <laughs> we're like the okay like this mm -hmm. is a hard one. It's so it I'll is. I'll share what I shared. We we had the pleasure of having the opportunity to chat previously to get to know each other, and I shared this is a hard one for me. Not because I don't know who I am authentically, right? I do. Um, I just don't want to give all of it to everybody else all the time. Um, and so I've tried to think about what that looks. So there's that piece of it. And then there's the piece of, right, this organization and this environment I'm in for work, what is that work self? What does that work authenticity look like? Because I'm probably not going to be listening to hardcore hip hop in the middle of um, like a business meeting, right? But I'm doing that all the time in, in my house, right? And so what are the pieces that you want to share about yourself in whatever the environment is. I think that's an important question to actually kind of self audit for you. I know I like work to be work and I like home to be home and I don't like to give all of myself to work because I like to have that distinction. But I think the balance is also being in an environment that aligns with what you want to share about yourself. So what you want to fully experience about yourself in that work environment, you should feel comfortable doing that. You shouldn't have to feel like you can't be that about yourself in that place um, and that people would or wouldn't understand that about you, that they wouldn't be able to embrace it and support that that's all of who you are. Um, I tend to be pretty silly um, frankly, like I love to laugh in the work that I do and I wanna have fun and I was really nervous about this chief diversity officer role because I'm like, okay, now you're going to be sitting at the executive boardroom and can you be your silly self? And I was delighted that I am around a whole bunch of chief this, chief that that are as silly as I am. I am like, this is nirvana. Like we're all making jokes. We're all laughing. We all divert off of something really important to say something completely inappropriate and, and like silly, right? Making a joke in it feels really good and it feels really comfortable because that part that really is important to me, I get to express that. Um, 
but it's it's layered and complex. And so I'll just I'll start there and I'll I'll let Sally chime in too. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, Adrian, listening to you talk about that because I, you know, I was I think starting out in my career, I was the opposite. I was like, know who I am. This is me. Like, and I think you know when you don't when you're not completely self aware of your the way you communicate and how you come to the table in certain situations. Um, because you are who you are all the time with everybody, you have to be careful that you don't create a brand for yourself that you don't want. Um, and I became that brand that, hey, if you want to plan something that's exciting and fun, go see Sally, which is fine. But I wasn't necessarily, that wasn't the first thing I wanted to come when people thought about Sally Vardis. I wanted them to think about me as that strategic business partner that could help them, yet I wasn't there yet, right? And so I really had to, ch I had to work hard to change part of my professional brand. Um, that was still me, it was still authentic. It was just choosing the right moments to be, uh, you know, the fun and engaging Sally and bringing everybody together versus, hey, let's look at the numbers and let's, you know, make that, create that narrative for what we need to do moving forward. So. For me, I had to learn when to pull it back and bring it forward in certain situations. And now I'm in a new role um, that is corporate role where I really have learned a lot about what it looks like uh, when you're communicating with board of directors versus the CEO of the organization versus your HR you know, peers and, and cohorts. So um, it, it is very different, right? You're not going to bring your full complete self, but um, don't change who you are, right? Um, you know, there are so many parts of who you are that make you um, valuable to an organization. And um, for me, you know, it was getting involved with one, becoming self-aware of my own communication style and really making a conscious effort to tweak certain behaviors and, and knowing how to handle certain circumstances. So, you know, dealing with conflict, how do I, how do, I do this? Giving an employee feedback, you know, what's the best way to do that? So the, the one piece of advice I can say is invest in yourself and learn about who you are and learn about how to get better as a professional as it relates to communication and clearly articulating your thoughts. That is, that was super important for me. Um, and, and people still know me as the, you know, the, 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 the C, the CFO, the chief, you know, the CEO, right? The chief, yeah. Chief fun oh. officer, right? <laughs> the chief fun officer. Um, and, and the person that's super creative. And even though I'm in HR, I like to get involved in innovation and, and different parts of the organization. I think people still see me like that. Um, but I really tried to change some of my brand um, as it relates to how I come to the table. Sally, I love that. I, I, that's so oh, oh, important. And I, I, I went through that too. Like I went through that evolution of what do I want the brand to be? So as you're thinking of this, you all, like there really are layers and it is important to think about all of those and what pieces are most important for your ability to, to thrive and excel in the roles that you are in in your organization. So all of that's really important. What I would offer is there are some core parts of your identity that are just critical. It is your value. It is the, the intersectionalities that help you define who you are. And those are the pieces that you shouldn't have to worry about having show up in your environment, right? Those are non-negotiables and you should be those and feel confident in those every step of the way. But your brand is really important and being thoughtful about what you want that brand to be is also, an, it is, is critical. Um, I, I'll offer this just personally for me because it might help you think that through. I am single and I have no children at almost 50. And in some roles, I thought that that was a, a negative, right? This notion that I couldn't speak about my children to build a connection in a conversation, couldn't talk about where they were going to school um, because it was, it was a very clear part of the community that I was in. Um, and I went back and forth with, do, do you over leverage your godchildren? Do you tell people that you don't have children and have them be like, oh, well, we can't really talk to her. I really b battled with that. I know it may seem silly, um, but it was a real thought. How do I make sure I connect in this environment 
with people who have children and it's important to the conversation and to the life that they live in the environment, right, at work. Um, and so I figured out a little of both. I definitely love my godchildren, so I talk about them where it makes sense, but I'm also very open that I don't have children. Um, and it actually works out just fine because now we giggle about all the time I have that they don't. Um, so, but it, but it works, right? But I had to really think that through for myself um, and recognize that it, it's a part of who I am and I don't wanna have to make excuses for that in an environment. And there are some things about that that are really equally important to you and you'll feel the same way about those. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, that, that even ties, it's just so well said because it's conversations we've had with some of our women in our organization about, you know, sometimes they're leaned on too much because their boss doesn't, you know, knows that they don't have kids and automatically it's this bias that now they have more time to work, right? They have just as important things to take care of and, and do for themselves. Um, and so we've been talking a lot about um, really just having non-negotiables when you, you know, and, and learning how to manage up uh, as you go into this kind of career work environment and a new work environment sometimes when we're moving a, mi a million miles per hour. Um, and sometimes even new managers don't know how to ask, how are you doing? Or, you know, why are you leaving at 4 p.m.? I, I, I learned early on that if I could have some good candid conversations with my manager around my non-negotiables, I first, I have, you know, two, two young children and, um, you know, there's times where I have to leave in the middle of the day to take care of what I need to take care of. Early in my career, did I think I was capable of doing that? No, right? I, I think I became more confident as I grew in my career. Early on though, what I will say is if you get really good at having, having some clear, you know, conversations around your non-negotiables, and you create that sense of connection with your managers, you will find that it's almost like your self guilt goes away, right? Um, because now you're clear about what you're doing. Now, now that's not just, hey, I've got to leave every day at three o'clock for a softball game, right? Um, but if there is something that is very important to you, right? I think it's important that you have that conversation with your manager and you figure out how to reprioritize some of that time and work. And I, I'll just really quick, Tasha. Sure. <laughs> if you go to that conversation and honestly share that you are trying to work these things out in partnership, like I can just imagine thinking about having to have that conversation with, with my boss when I was in my really early 20s or even in my latter teens in that first role. And it, it might've felt really intimidating, but if you go to that conversation, really thinking about finding the best way to partner so that the team succeeds and you succeed, I think managers will listen, right? I think that leaders will listen. Um, and they frankly might be surprised that somebody was mature enough to come to talk to them about it. So don't shy away from the conversations. You can connect with your career services offices, with your collab partners, right? With with peers to role play the conversation if you want to, but I would encourage you to try to lean into it because I think it will pay better dividends than not having a conversation. And, and it ties back to authenticity, right? I think if you are being true to what's important to you, um, you know, someone has to appreciate that, right? Um, and, I, and I just think back as a manager, if I know what's going on in my employee's head or life, right? I am no longer making assumptions about what I think they are or not are or, or not doing. Um, and so therefore, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I connected with one of my directs the other day and I was like, man, I'm so glad I asked her how she was doing. No, really, how are you? Because she emptied her bucket and I was like, whoa, I didn't even realize she was going through this. And she felt comfortable enough to come to me and say, you know, and tell me, but also after saying, thank you for checking in, right? People just don't know how sometimes how to check in and, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to empty your dirty laundry out on them, but, you know, if you can give them some insight into what you're dealing with, you know, you'd be surprised how much flexibility or um, clarity you get in terms of their expectations of you and your expectations of, of the role, so. Sure.
Thank you. Um, I think we all got really excited here behind the scenes about the managing up question um, that you mentioned, Sally. So we'd love to, um, and students, of course, or attendees, of course, feel free to chat those questions that you have. But that's a question um, I think that I'd love to ask you both. Um, you know, how, how could you, how do you manage up? What does that look like in creating that boundary, like in the workplace? Good one. It's so it's, I think it's so much easier as you go and you have more experience because you also learn a little bit more what you're right, what what you are open to doing, what you're not open to doing, right? And and how to speak about that. But when I generally think about managing up, I come from it in two ways. Um, one, I'm always being thoughtful about what the organization needs and what my leadership needs. Like, how do I make sure you succeed? If I'm always thinking about this from the point of how can I help you succeed, then we're all gonna succeed better. So I tend to have that as a, as a thought in my head is like, how do I enable your success? Um, but two, also being really frank and clear with how I can best do that, <laughs> all right? If my goal is to ensure that you are succeeding, there are probably some things I need to make sure that I can do that in the best way possible. And so really communicating that from this frame of partnership has really worked well for me um, and throughout my career, right? Like it's, it's been a pretty consistent throughout and just the notion that I'm going to communicate so that you know what's going on, you know what's happening, you know where deadlines are, you know what, you're right? This notion of no surprises, mm -hmm. taking that approach of, I don't want you to ever be surprised, so I'm gonna make sure that you have all the information you need has always worked well for me. So those are a few tips I would offer. Yeah, I, I look at it, I, I have to visualize everything. So in my head, I'm like, okay, how do I bucket this? Because managing up is a lot of categories. Um, when I think about it from a feedback perspective, and you know, maybe you haven't received feedback in a few weeks, and you're just really, you really want it, um, don't wait for it, right? Solicit that feedback. And I always think about it. Um, if you can get good at coaching questions, having some like four good coaching open-ended questions in your back pocket to go to, um, rather than saying, hey, how'd I do in that presentation the other day? Um, it's, it's more around, you know, hey, and again, align it back to the company's objective and the team objective. How does what you're asking fit into the bigger picture for the organization or for the team? Um, so if you're looking for feedback on your performance, you know, Hey, I just wanted to have a conversation on, you know, the re my recent performance over the last quarter. Um, would love to get your perspective. If they say, yeah, it's been great. Great, thank you. Can you give me a few examples of where I've really excelled? Get clear and concise feedback because sometimes not everyone knows how to give good feedback, right? And you have to be able to just unpack it a little bit more, double click into, yeah, you did great. Or no, it wasn't. It really hasn't been that great. Okay, thanks for your thanks for the you know thanks for that feedback. Can you give me some examples of where I could have I could have done better, or where did I do really well, and what can I do to improve upon that? Right. So making sure you get really good at some of those clarifying questions is really good for getting some feedback from your from your manager, your peers, what have you. Um, when I think about negotiation, right. Um, for me, uh, some of the best advice that I got in my career was, you know, I said, how do I move up? I, something that motivated, I, I had a lot of uh, opportunity to do coaching and get coached in my life. And um, I finally found out what my, my driver and motivator is, and it's to want more. Uh, so meaning I can't be present and I, I have to really try to be present before I think about what's next. And so I remember going to my boss at the time, or I think she was my mentor because I'd moved on to a new boss, but um, I said, what can I do to move up? What, what's next, right? What can I, she said, Sally, make a name for yourself. Do something for the organization that they can use for times to come after you've moved on to a new role, right? Think about it in that sense. And I said, okay, I get it. And I always put that mind frame on things that I do. Um, and I take pride in the work that I do because I want to be known for, someone taking that and utilizing it or helping them in their, in their own uh, career or in their own uh, business. Um, what I will say there is, you know, you have to think about what it's, ask them what it's going to take for me to get to the next level in terms of competencies. What are the skills that you feel I need to get to the next level? 
and then go talk to somebody that's in that role and find out what that looks like, right? And then assess yourself and say, do I feel I'm ready or help me? Let's work collaboratively to get me prepared for that next role, right? The, that would be kind of my advice in terms of how you have those conversations. It's really important in how you say things, not always about what you're saying. Really, really great advice. Um, thank you both. I, and I took a few notes um, myself here, <laughs> so I hope the attendees did as well. Um, we did have a few questions that came in. I wanna make sure that we get those answered um, for the students here. Um, the first question is how can students talk about these tough subjects during COVID times, given most likely will be virtual, more likely to start our jobs virtually? Good question. So my experience has been thus far in COVID and in the virtual environment. So one, it is harder to build a relationship if you can't sit down in front of somebody and um, or be around them often to see how they engage and what their um, uh, habits are, right? And so it, it is more difficult. So one, know that, right? It's a little harder. You're probably going to have to work work a little harder at it. Um, but it is possible, I think. And what I feel like I've seen in organizations are an intent to make sure that people have a, a place of connection because of COVID. Um, and, and so two things I would offer that are pretty concrete. One is try to have a conversation with your, so if we're talking about managing up, have the conversation with your manager on a camera, right? Try to get to see them very much like we're having this conversation and you can see our mannerisms and our responses. Try to be on camera for the, the, the crucial conversations or the really important conversations so it feels like you have more of a connection. Um, and I have still seen, right, this notion of finding your, your, your place in the organization. I've still seen um, a lot of team member resource groups having meetings and having social events, as strange as it may seem, virtually, right? Mm -hmm. So doing it on camera. And so I would engage in those and participate and ask questions in the chat if you don't necessarily want to raise your hand and ask it on camera. Like people will respond to that and will engage. Um, and then the, the last tip that I would offer is if it's definitely in this COVID environment and you're virtual, ask for a buddy, right? Ask if the organization doesn't offer you one, ask for one. Say, like, who can you connect me with who might be able to answer like the silly questions that I'm thinking about or the culture questions and help me kind of figure out the ropes. I think organizations are either be thoughtful enough to do that in advance or would be very responsive if you asked for it. And I think those are some things that particularly in COVID in this virtual environment might start to help along the way. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, COVID has taught us a lot um, and we have learned that we can really do our jobs from home. Um, and so for us, you know, Stanley Black & Decker, for example, they are moving into a hybrid world of virtual, uh, you know, flexible and on site. And, and, you know, a majority will be virtual for the most part. Um, and you know, there's going to be times where it feels like Zoom fatigue and you just don't want to jump on another Zoom or another Teams. Um, but what I can say is be prepared with the meetings that you are attending. Think about questions that maybe you want to ask ahead of time. Um, stay engaged as much as you can um, in those meetings, right? Uh, because that's how you are really going to be able to uh, make yourself heard. And really, once the more you engage in those conversations, the more you start to connect with, with folks across the room, right? Um, and also get involved in anything that might be cross-functional uh, project related, because that will allow you to really stretch your network outside of just your function. Um, if you, you know, make HR your friend, right? It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, only when things are bad or when you have a problem. Um, they're there to obviously connect you to all the resources and benefits that you have. Um, but to Adrian's point, a buddy is super important. Someone that's been in the organization that can show you the ropes. Sometimes there's nuances within a culture of a company that you can't find online or through a, an Outlook org chart, right? Um, so uh, make sure that you try to get connected with somebody that can kind of answer those one-off questions for you or 
you know, what's the best way to reach out to somebody? Is it through text? Is it through Zoom? Is it, there's so many different ways that we virtually connect now. So finding out their communication styles uh, based on if it's a fire drill or if it's a, you know, just a regular connection is also really important. Excellent, excellent. And we have a few more questions that are coming in. I definitely want to be mindful of um, everyone's times as well. Um, the next question is, in your personal opinion, what can workplaces do better in terms of diversity and inclusion? Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I should probably let Sally go first. <laughs> oh. But I just, I'll, I'll tell Tom. Um, the thing that I find most, the thing that I find most um, significant, I think is the right word, is this notion that, so two things. One, I think we go, go into environments expecting everybody to get us because we get us, right? So I'm thinking about myself, right? And the things about me that are really important and I just want the organization to get it, right? I don't want to have to explain it. I don't want to have to right, help you understand, I just want you to get it. Um, what I recognize is that that's probably not realistic, but it's what I want, right? I, I wanna walk in the door and have you just get all the parts of me and have it work smoothly. Uh, but we're in environment environments with individuals that are as, right, layered as we are. Um, and it means that we have to also get those layers about them. And so this reality that it's um, nuanced and it's individualized because we are all nuanced individuals is what's real. Um, and so one of the things I think organizations could do better is just own that and just say that, right? Just be upfront with it's individualized. Like we're not one program or one approach isn't going to solve for the fact that, right, all of the uniquenesses of who I am are those things. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I think we could do better. And then the second thing that I think we could do better really harkens back to something Sally said earlier is that it really is about inclusion, right? It, it really is about leveraging, not harping on all the things that are different about us. Well, I think we should celebrate those things, but really think about how do we leverage them yeah. right, to help us be better, to include voices in decision-making, to include skills in the way we approach our work, to include perspectives and how we view who we are, that bringing them together is really what makes us strongest and best. And focusing on that, I think, is something that we could do better. Yeah, I, I you know, there is so much, right? I think <laughs> taking the experience for, I mean, I've had a lot of opportunities to speak to outside organizations and just talk to them about our strategy or, you know, our go-to over the years. And the biggest takeaway is that it's not one size fits all. And I think leaders have to understand that. I think organizations have to understand that. And it has to start with just curiosity. Um, leaders have to be more curious about who they're working with, right? Ask questions if you don't know. Um, you know, early on, Adrian introduced herself with her pronouns, which I forgot to do, but it's a constant thing that I have to remind myself to do to create an inclusive environment um, you know, especially as, you know, I worked with our LGBTQ Pride and Allies Network, they, they were the ones that said, we want to create this as part of our culture. And the only way that's going to happen is if our leadership team gets on board, right? Some stuff can't always be a groundswell. Sometimes leaders have to model by example. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I love that we're seeing now is our CEO of our organization, you know, his commitment externally, internally, the words are matching the actions. And that's the other thing is, it's great to have a value proposition around diversity, equity, inclusion on your website, but if you are not actually doing anything in, in the organization or holding people accountable for it, nothing is going to change, right? So the accountability has to be there. Um, and I just wish that uh, we could immediately tie that to, to a bonus and everything. We'd see a quick change, but um, you know, I, I think everyone's getting there at their di at different levels. And, and but what I will say is, it takes it takes longer than it should for people to see the impact that having a diverse workforce and an inclusive environment, the type of equitable treatment it can provide. And um, the other part, especially in, in this environment that we're in now is this idea of empathy versus sympathy, right? 
teaching leaders, I mean, again, it goes back to educating leaders about truly empath being empathetic, which is about listening versus, hey, I know how you feel. Yeah, I'm so sorry that you're, you're dealing with that, right? There's a difference there. Trying to understand where someone is coming from change your, changes your perspective, therefore changes the way that you, that you behave. Sympathizing is just, hey, I'm sorry. I feel sorry for you, right? I'm sorry. Um, that there's a difference. And so I just, I, I'm hoping that there is a hashtag COVID win. I hate to say that, but that people are more empathetic, that are, they're giving people grace and they're truly trying to understand, you know, everyone's situation and, and the layers of intersectionality that occurs across the organization. I would add one other thing, um, and this is a challenge to each of you. Um, and it's related to this notion that the, the, the innate curiosity that Sally spoke to, we all have to also have that innate curiosity. You're gonna have to have that innate curiosity around all the individuals around you, and you're gonna have to give them that same level of grace because you're gonna have a situation where you're not quite agreeing with, with somebody else on your team about something and thinking of the right way to work through that probably is layered by who they are and all the experiences in the background they bring to it and the same for you. So being innately curious and showing up in a way that values and respects the others that you also work with will be really, really important. And it's, it's, it, it really is, while I agree 100%, it is top down the way that organizations will change and move. But if every member of the organization doesn't do their part to actually be a part of that inclusive environment, it'll also never work. So, um, so the challenge you, I, the challenge I can offer you is as you go into organizations, be innately curious and offer that to others, right? Share the things about you that you are comfortable with so that they can start to learn a little bit more about who you are so that they can be better partners and engage you as well. And I have one more thing because this just maybe remind, reminded me, oh my goodness, Adrian. So one of the things that I think I learned way too later on in my career, um, or just even as an individual is, assume good intent. If you imagine if everybody assumed good intent, there, there would be much more productive conversations. If I had assumed good intent early in my career, I would have never made some assumptions that I've made across, you know, my life or it within my, within my organization or with people that I interact with, right? Because they act, they ask more questions or they, you know, they're, they're playing devil's advocate. Early in my career, I'm like, God, they're just stifling my flow. Like, what's going on? Let's move, right? Now I'm assuming good intent, right? If you can assume good intent, that will help you so much navigate the, the relationships that you have in, in the workplace. Well, I know we are short on uh, time here, reached our time, actually. I want to thank you both for this really great session. Um, we, I think we, it sounds like we need to have a part two um, of this session. So I um, absolutely want to put that on your radar, um, that that's going to be happening very soon. Um, but we want to thank you again both for attending uh, this session and really sharing this wonderful um, insights. Um, thank you, students, also um, for attending. What we'd like to do is drop the um, information here for our credentials month events that we'll be hosting this um, this month. So we have a few events still happening, um, sessions just like this. Feel free to join and that way you can ask any questions that you have um, about the Capital Collab or any of the um, activities that we're doing. Again, thank you all for attending this really great session. Um, hope you have a great day. Thank you.